Michael said that this was the day the Lord has made and we will rejoice in it. Do you know in the place where we stay here, there's a big thing, um, frame thing that you wake up in the morning and it says, this is the day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. I stood in front of it at 5.30 this morning, well, a little bit earlier than that, and said, no, it isn't. <laughs> it's raining and miserable, and if you loved me, the sun would shine. <laughs> and then the Keurig was working, and I got co- I'm an atheist. <laughs> I'm an atheist before I get coffee, but after I get coffee, I'm pretty... And by the time I got here and worshiped uh, this morning, uh, I, I can say from my heart, this is the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's pray. Father, uh, this morning as we consider some hard stuff about ourselves Uh, remind us that the tunnel ends and the light shines so take the reality of who we are and place it with who you are and then put it in our heads and our hearts and in our hands and feet because the world so needs to hear the laughter of the redeemed. Father, as always, we pray for the one who teaches that you would forgive him his sins because they are many. We would see Jesus and him only. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let me tell you something that's really important. I want you to remember it. Because most of us don't think it's true, but it really is. And we're going to talk about it this morning. Christian life is not so much what you do as it is how you perceive what you do. Let me say say it again. The Christian life isn't so much what you do, but it's how you look at perceive, and think about, intentionally think about what you do and how you live and uh, what you say. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of texts. Uh, One is kind of long and one is really short. Uh, The first one uh, is... uh, John 8, 31 through 32, and you're familiar with it. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now generally when we read that, we, and rightly so, we think, that the truth that we have as Christians means that we can deal with the lies that are told us every day by the world, and it does mean that. It, of course, means the truth that we're forgiven. And so when you feel guilty for any other reason than that it drives you to Jesus, you know the truth. Counter the lie. You're going, when you're afraid of death, you're going to live forever. That's the truth, counter the lie. But one thing we don't think about very often is that when Jesus said that, it encompasses truths in other places, like the truth about who you really are. If you're his disciple, you'll know the truth about your name, about why you were created, about who you are, about why you have been called. 
And then I want to go into the Psalms and look at the 51st Psalm. It's the Psalm of David, one of the most profound passages in the entire Bible. David, as you know, has really messed it up. I love David because I tell Jesus I'm bad, but I'm not that bad. <laughs> and then he says, but you could be. <laughs> Man, d really bad stuff, including adultery and murder. And, uh, and then he's called... And, that's crazy, man after God's own heart. What in the world is that about? I mean, I would have picked somebody else. <laughs> and then you begin to see it when with your heart you listen to the 51st Psalm. Listen to this. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions. And my sin is ever before me against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise, for you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Do good in Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem then will you delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be sacrificed in your name. <laughs> I just want to quit. That's enough. I mean, that is so clearly what I want to teach. I just can't tell you. And I've been dealing with it over the last many days as I was thinking about what I was going to say to me. And after God had said it to me, how I'm going to say it to you. Let me give you one of my favorite quotes, and you've heard me use it before. And uh, it's by a Roman Catholic priest. I wish it had been a Baptist. <laughs> Better it'd be a Presbyterian. <laughs> But, but listen, this is Ronald Rohe Um 
And it's this, in his book, The Holy Longing, and this is what he says. To be connected with the church is to be associated with scoundrels, warmongers, fakes, child molesters, murderers, adulterers, and hypocrites of every description. It also, at the same time, identifies you with saints and the finest persons of heroic soul within every time. Country, race, and gender. To be a member of the church is to carry a mantle of both the worst sin and the finest heroism in the world because the church always looks exactly as it did at the original crucifixion. God hung between two thieves. I have a friend who has a very dark story. Uh, I'm not going to tell you, but it is a very dark story, and it got worse the last two weeks. And uh, I want to read to you something, and I got his permission as long as I didn't use his name uh, to read it to you. This is what he wrote me. You well know why we turn off people outside of the church and why we will never stop doing it. We are pompous, arrogant, and self-righteous windbags displaying our neurotic obsession with being seen by the world as good. We're so afraid and angry with grace that we can't stand it. Most of us don't even know what grace is, let alone experience it. We are so upside down. Jesus, without exception, always used bad people to display the goodness of God. We are addicted to perpetual denial. Jesus doesn't go to church. He goes to AA meetings. Now, that's a little rough. Uh, we were talking uh, in the green room before we came here, and Michael said, I love the people you attract. <laughs> he said, these are the best people that come. You are. You laugh easy. I sometimes feel like I'm preaching to the pew. <laughs> I told Michael the others left. <laughs> and made an obscene gesture when they did. <laughs> I used to get taken off of radio stations at least once a month. That doesn't happen much anymore because they, they all left or died or sinned or got jungle rot. You don't mess with the God's anointed. And, So it's a little bit rust, and, I, and I, I'm not talking to the right crowd, I don't think, because I think you get what this is about, that at a profound level you understand grace. I'm often praised for being authentic. hate that word, and I'm not. I'm just smart. It's best for me to tell you about me and put my spin on it than you listen to others who put their spin on it. And so I'm pretty much open about who I am. But let me tell you something that is really cool about me. Uh, I hardly ever, if ever, lie to myself. I hardly ever, if ever, lie to myself. And you know why? Because I've discovered that it's a lot harder to be self-righteous if you walk with Jesus than it is to be self-aware. Let me say that again. 
it's a lot harder work to be self-righteous if you walk with Jesus than it is to be self-aware. And that's what we're going to be talking about this time. I miss Fred Smith a lot. I've told you the story about how he showed up at his own funeral, <laughs> recorded a video for it just before I was to get up. It was in Dallas, and there were two or 3,000 people there. And I could barely talk. And he, before he died, and he's been in heaven a lot of years, before he died, the week before he died, he recorded a video for me. And I've never seen it. Maybe on my deathbed I'll look at it. I just can't. I just can't get through it. But I know what he'd say about almost everything. Uh, we were friends for over 35 years. And uh, as he said about his mentor, I can say about Fred, we still have conversations and we still talk. And one of the cool things Fred did, he had a friend who was dying of cancer and had about three months to live. And this friend um, called his friends to him and said, I need a board for dying, so you'll be my board of directors. He said to one man, you will oversee my finances. Make sure that my family is taken care of and everything is in order as it should be. Turned to his pastor and said, you're going to be over spiritual things. Your forte is religion. And with religion, you're going to be my member of the board of directors for dying over religious stuff. And then his doctor, there were two doctors there, and he said, and you guys are going to be on my board of dying, and you're going to oversee the physical stuff. You're going to tell me what's going on. You're going to make sure that I don't die in pain, and you're going to look at the x-rays and bring your expertise to the table. And Fred felt left out. So he said to his friend, why am I here? What's going to be my job description? And his friend said, Fred, I appoint you as my BS filter. <laughs> <laughs> he said, when you're dying, people lie to you and they tell you things that aren't true. And uh, I need somebody who'll stand next to me and tell me the truth when it's nonsense and drivel. And that is your job description. And Fred did that until the day his friend died. You know, that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. And what he teaches us to do for ourselves. We are called to be BS filters. And I'm going to show you some things about that. Uh, that are very important. Let me tell you something. The greatest danger in the church, and by the way, two years ago, I said we're sitting on top of an awakening in America. I stand by those words. I really believe that. Because as in AA, you don't get sober till you get so drunk that you're at the bottom. You don't find Jesus until there's nothing else that's available. And we're getting very quickly to the point where nothing else is unavailable. And we are coming to the end of ourselves in America, and we have an awakening. But let me tell you the most dangerous thing in the church. It's not our being unfaithful. We said to the world when we joined this bunch, we're joining a bunch of ragamuffins, sinners, people who are marginalized, people who have blown it, people who don't have their act together. And then somehow we get in the church and we develop the disease. And the most dangerous thing that can happen to us is denial, is to play the game 
to pretend that we're good and pure and righteous and a revival in the world will make people good and pure and righteous the way we are. That's not what revival is. Revival, awakening is awareness. Revival and awakening is to deny denial. Revival and awakening, and you can tell it in the church when people get up and say, I got some stuff I got to tell you about me. I'm not good. I'll tell you about the time at Presbytery, and then I got to get into this. Uh, one of our leaders' name was Ray, and some of the younger guys decided we're going to have uh, things done different. Pre Presbytery, by the way, for those of you who are not Presbyterians, is a local body of churches. And when they meet together, it's made up of elders, teaching, and ruling elders in that particular geographical area. And Ray said, we're going to have revival. And we're going to, the way we're going to, we're going to do Presbytery different. And we're going to confess our sins to each other. And then he confessed his. Good night. And they weren't and they weren't popcorn stuff either. And then he said, It's your turn. And guys started standing up and confessing their hatred for Jim over here, their lust, their anger, their and one after another, these guys, I'm sitting on the back row. That's where old guys sit. And pretty soon it was getting pretty short. Everybody almost had finished and everybody's turning around and they're looking back at me. I was the professor in seminary for a lot of those young men and they were interested <laughs> in my sins. And I'm thinking, <laughs> so finally I stood up. I said, if you think I'm going to confess my sins to you. You're a fruitcake. <laughs> You're not safe. You don't love me enough, and you don't understand grace enough for me to confess my sins before you. So there, and I sat down. And then, maybe it was the spirit, I stood back up and said, maybe that's my confession. And they laughed. And it was cool. But the thing that will kill us, I don't, I'm not big on public confessions or public discipline. Put that down. <laughs> That's going to be on the video. <laughs> Listen, the attendance that the COVID is going to be cut in half. They're going to say, what are they doing up there? The speaker's got a cigar in his hand. I'm not big on public stuff. I don't believe in public shaming. I hate that. I think it's always done wrong and it always kills people and the result is hardly ever good. So when they ask you, when you've done something bad, to stand before the church and confess your sins, tell them to go to heaven. <laughs> but there has to be an honesty, a flavor of openness like I'm nobody, Dickerson, who are you? Are you nobody too? It has to be a flavor in the church of recognition that we're all messed up bad and there isn't any sin of which we're not capable and we have failed so often. The danger in the church is to get the disease and to pretend that we're something other than that. And you say, no, oh, I feel guilty. Well, I do too. You think you're phony, you ought to be in my place. I mean, I, my job depends on my being phony. It's a horrible place to be. 
My job depends on not saying certain things to certain people in certain ways. My job depends on being phony. It depends on denial. But I've asked Jesus to stop it for you and for me. Let me give you a quote. Otto Rank was a colleague of Freud who was sicker than his clients. And Rank recognized that, by the way, and parted company um, with Freud. And let me read you something that he said. Man is more normal, healthy, or happy the more he can successfully repress, displace, deny, rationalize, dramatize himself, and deceive others. Human character is a vital lie. The more stable the character, the more successful the lie. What we call human character is basically a lie about the nature of reality. Now, I don't agree with that. I mean, I get what he's saying. It makes a salient point. But what he's saying, insofar as you can live in denial, you'll be happy. Insofar as you live in denial, you'll be normal. Insofar as you live in denial, you can get through hard things in life a lot better than you would if you didn't live in denial. That's a lie. It's not true. In fact, the road to freedom and joy is when, is when you stop it. You know, I don't like being old. I hate it. And if you're old and you like it, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> I knew somebody would do it, uh, would give me an amen on that. But I just, um, I just hate being old. But let me tell you something. There's a good side of being old. I spoke at the graduation of our granddaughter at Bellhaven University just a month ago. And I had a wonderful, and that is a great, they, made, they gave me another doctorate. So I'm getting, so I have a bunch of phony doctorates <laughs> that I didn't earn. I tell the professors I work with that I got my doctorate in 30 minutes and they paid me <laughs> and made me a, a doctor. But I said to those students, you're very fortunate to have me. And they kind of giggle. And I said, the reason you're fortunate to have me is obviously not because I'm good looking or because I'm wise or smart or super spiritual. You're fortunate to have me because I'm old. And I don't give a rip. <laughs> so if you want to know the truth, don't go to somebody who's young and thinking about the career and who they're going to offend. Go to somebody who's old as dirt, and they'll tell you the truth. And so you listen to what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you the truth because I'm old. And there's something to that. There is a good thing. I'm not looking for a bigger church. I love you guys, but I won't be devastated if you don't love me back. I, I kid about I need the job, but I really don't. I can pay the mortgage and take Anna to dinner and go to a movie and afford to do it. But more than any time in my, so I don't really need the job if I wanted to walk. George Bingham, Dr. George Bingham, by the way, his doctorate is not phony. He worked his posterior off to get his doctorate. But uh, George is the president of Key Life. And he and Ruth, I love more than I can tell you. We've been friends for a hundred years. And he's, the pre he's my boss. He's the president of Key Life. And I'm just kind of a hanger on. 
And if George wanted to, and he won't, because I know dirt on him. <laughs> if he wanted to. <laughs> if he, listen, I'm the preacher. Quit responding. <laughs> but he, uh, but if he did, uh, I'd be all right. I could do that. But being old means I'm free. And I do think, I just don't know which parts, that a part of that's Jesus, and a part of it's the Holy Spirit, and a part of it's getting old, and a part of it's having friends like these. But let me show you. I've got five tragedies that take place when you do the denial thing. And as I said, this is not a great positive time. And I'm, I know, I, I saw you look at your watch. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, you know, five, good heavens. I'm not even going to get lunch. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. But, but I think you need to know those. And the first tragedy of denial is what it does to your relationship with God. Look at that 51st Psalm, verses 3 through 4. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me against you, and you only have I sinned. Now, you've been taught, and I have taught, that you can't break your relationship with God, but you can break your fellowship with God with your sin. That's not true. If that were true, I wouldn't have any fellowship with God. In my struggles, I mean, that's not true. But let me tell you what denial does. When you go to God, Peter Marshall used to say at that church in Washington he served, they would sing, take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I be, would withhold. And Peter Marshall would stop the organist and the singing. And he would say, you don't, you don't mean that. You simply, if he touched your gold, you're, you'd be angry. You, so don't sing it unless you mean it. Well, don't pray it unless you mean it. Because there is silence in the heavens when we justify ourselves, and there is no justification and God is there. It hurts. Do you know my most honest time in my life? It's my prayer time every morning, and I live on that. That sounds so pious, and I don't mean it to be so pious. And I've told you before, if you came in while I was praying, you'd be shocked. The language is not always good, and sometimes I'm yelling at God, and I'm telling, well, he knows what I'm thinking. I mean, it's not as if God says, I don't believe you said that. <laughs> I thought better of you. And so I tell him, I grade him. I tell him the people he hurt. And ultimately, it's, it's his fault. People I love. I uh, go down a list sometimes. And he always says, Without exception, you threw. <laughs> and I go, yeah. And then he loves me. That's fellowship. Fellowship is where you go before the God of the universe and ask him to take away the denial. I'll say it again, and it's really important. It is so much harder when you walk with Jesus to do self-righteousness than it is to do self-awareness. Because in that love, remember I said to those young men at Presbytery, you don't love me enough. And you're not safe. God does. And he's safe. And so I don't have to play games. And you don't either. And when you play games, I started to say Jesus leaves the building, and he doesn't. 
But when you play games before God, there is an eternal silence that is deafening and will eat you alive. Do you, do you hear about that woman who was in the hospital and for all intents and purposes died? had an out-of-body experience, went before God, and God said, it's not your time. You're going to live for a long time. And then she came back into her body, and sure enough, she started getting better and eventually got well. And she thought, you know, before I get out of this place, I'm going to fix some things. And so she had a tummy tuck done and a <laughs> facelift done. They, she called her hairdresser, and she got her hair done in a whole new style, and she looked really, really sharp. And they finally released her from the hospital. She walked out of the hospital door, and a truck hit her and killed her. <laughs> and, when she, and this was for real. When she got home, she said, what's with that? You said I was going to live a long time. And God said, Frankly, I didn't recognize you. <coughs> don't ever let God say that to you. Frankly, I don't recognize you. You're saying things to me you don't believe. You're talking about yourself in ways that are not true. You're pretending, and I don't recognize you. A lot harder to be self-righteous than it is to be self-aware in the face of that kind of love. Let me show you something else. Secondly, the most tragic thing about denial is that it's created out of a fabric that others made and this is about shame, and not yourself or God the way it ought to be. Psalm 51, 6, Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. That's the place we go when we go before him. But we go with him as Dr. Bush said last night, we go with him with the trauma of what others have said about us and how they defined us. Let me tell you something that's been interesting in my life. I have always been looking for a place that would be my place where I was comfortable and accepted and appreciated. And several times I've had opportunities to have a place like that. And God, without a single exception, with, that, with maybe the exception of the cove, God has taken those things away. And then he's given me another chance when I try, and then I think I'm home, and I'm not home, and God takes it away. And I often say, what are you doing this for? Because... He says often, I'm your place. And when you get that, the, let me give you an example. I was invited two or three years before I was supposed to do it, and I'm not going to tell you the name of the organization, but it's a big one, for their international gathering in Europe to be the keynote speaker. Six months before I was to be there, the president of this organization called me and he sounded kind of hesitant. And I thought, oh my, I, he's got something bad. And uh, he talked about the weather and how I was doing and how my latest book was going. And, and I finally said to him, Sam, and that's not his name, Sam, out with it. Why did you call me? He said, well, 
we've been praying about this and we've thought about it a lot. And we just don't think you're a good fit for us. And so we're going to ask somebody else to speak that keynote speech in that place. And I said, you know, I cover it well. Well, I didn't want to go anyway. <laughs> and I've always thought y'all were heretics. <laughs> and it would have hurt my reputation, but I didn't say that. I was, I was kind and said, I get understand. And then, then I prayed. I said, Lord, that I'm not a good fit. What's with that? Not a good fit. And Jesus said, you fit with me. And instead of obsessing on that and thinking I'm awful and I'm terrible and I've been rejected and the shame of it, I've decided to go to God and let him define me in my lack of denial who I really am. And listen to me, he thinks I'm something else. <laughs> he really does. And you know the hardest thing about being a Christian? This is going to surprise you. It's to not be arrogant. I'm not talking about self-righteousness. I'm, I'm talking about being the child of a king. One guy said to me one time after I'd spoken, you're arrogant and rude. And I said, that's true. And it's worse than you think it is. <laughs> but I really do fight arrogance. What I just said to you when I said that Jesus said, I think you're something else, means he really thinks I'm something else. And he's the king. And he's the only one who has the authority to define who I am. He is the only one on the face of the earth. Nobody else should have that power not your mother or your father or your spouse or your boss or your friend. Nobody should have that power over you except God. And he likes you a lot. Deal with it. <laughs> and then thirdly, the tragedy of denial. By the way, one of the really cool things in uh, Mark 14 I don't have time to share it with you, is when Jesus said, one of you are going to mess this up bad. You're going to betray me. And uh, John didn't say, I know who it is. It's Peter. He's, I know he'll do it. <laughs> and Peter said, no, nah, it'll be James and John. They're hell's angels of the first century. You, <laughs> you, can't, you can't trust them. <laughs> Every solitary one of them said, is it I? Is that cool? Jesus created a place where the most horrible sin that anybody would ever commit in the history of the world, personally responsible for the crucifixion of the Son of God, where they could say, is it I? That's the safe place where we live. Um. Thirdly, uh, the most tragic thing about denial is that it makes you self-righteous. And uh, God hates self-righteousness. Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Let me, do you, you know who Beth Moore is? Everybody knows who Beth Moore is. She's probably the most popular Bible teacher in America. She's wonderful. Do you know who Anne Lamott is? She wrote Traveling Mercies, and you can't give it to your children because the language is so bad. She's a, a left-wing wacko liberal, and, and she's our friend. We've interviewed her a number of times. First time, it started really bad, and she ended up saying, Steve, if we ever met, 
you know what we would do? And I said, no. And she said, we would hold hands and tell each other stories of Jesus. Um, Beth Moore is straight. She's a Baptist or was a Baptist. I think she's become something else. And uh, I mean, every hair is in place. Uh, her dress is from the finest stores. She's very articulate. She has a wonderful Southern accent. Anne Lamont, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> she, she just she just out of the box in the way she dresses and what she says and what. Let me read you a tweet that Anne Lamont wrote. Uh, this is what she writes. I'm listening to Carrie Underwood sing Baptist hymns because Beth Boom Boom Moore tells me to do something, I do it. People can't believe that we love each other so. Ex-Southern Baptist and aging left-wing Jesus freak, we are a two-woman reconciliation project. <laughs> that was so good. I couldn't believe it. I said, no, that's not happening. She's lying. And so I picked up the phone and called Tony Campolo. By the way, pray for him. That doesn't mean you have to agree with him because he's wrong about a lot of stuff. That's why we did that television program for so long. Um, but he had a major stroke almost died. I talked to him pretty soon after that. He didn't even remember talking. He, he's so many he's still his speech. He's one of the finest speakers I've ever known. He can't speak. And, and uh, Peggy, his wife, um, has gone through just awful times. So do pray for him. I talk to him every two or three weeks because I love him and he loves me. And it's kind of like this like the Anne Lamont, uh, Beth Moore thing, only on a different scale altogether. Uh, we debated each other two or three years ago, and he had just come out for gay marriage, another wacko idea. And um, he said st he had evidently been hurt a lot by people who wouldn't be his friend anymore. And he called me and he said, Steve, you know I love you. And if you don't want to do this debate, I'll, I'll understand. I said, Tony, it's just another one of your wacko views. I'll add it to the list. You're, you're my, and he thinks the same thing about me. I, I said, I love you, man. I'm going to do that debate, and I'll be proud to do it with you. And he got emotional and gave the phone to Peggy and, I said, how are you guys doing? And she said, well, as long as we have friends like you, we're okay. But anyway, all, I didn't mean to share all that with you. I'm good. Um, so I called Tony and I read that tweet from Ann Lamont and he said, that's us. That's us. And so the, when you live in denial, you become self-righteous and God hate self-righteousness. It's clear in this psalm. And so do your neighbors. And so do your friends. And so do the people you love. There's something else. The fourth great tragedy about denial is that it puts you in a prison from which it's hard to escape. Psalm 51, 7 through 8, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear the joy and gladness. Let the bones of you have broken rejoice. David is referring to where he's been and it's been no fun. And so in order to get through it, and he had plenty of people around him who would lie to him and tell him how wonderful he was. Good heavens, he was the king. But there was something about a prison that he got into and it's addicting. And you get into it and you just can't get out of it.
We, uh, one of the questions we get at Key Life as much as any other is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Evidently, a lot of people in this country write me and say, I think I've committed the unforgivable sin. And I write them back and said, no, you didn't. If you had, you wouldn't have written your letter. Because blasphemy of the Holy Spirit means you don't care. You never ask the question, have I committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? It doesn't bother you. You've moved so far away from God that you can't hear his voice anymore. And by the way, if any of you believe you've committed the unforgivable sin, you haven't, or you wouldn't be here, all right? But I'll tell you what can happen. If you go into his presence with the mask that you wear everywhere and there, you get into that prison and it becomes home. And after a while, you can't hear God anymore. They say if your devotional life is really bad, praise God, I agree with that. But do something else. Say, search me, O God and know me, and reveal to me who I am and what I've done and why I'm here. And then finally, uh, it's a tragedy because it hurts those you love. I've already told you what about to think about public confessions. I don't believe the church is that safe. but, But I think going, standing before God without a mask, which is easy. It's a lot easier to be self-aware than it is to be self-righteous, at least at the beginning. Self-righteousness requires a whole lot of effort. Self-awareness requires none. If you're loved and you're acceptable, and once that begins to happen to you, there's a smell about you that is different. It's not self-righteous. It's not condemning. It doesn't hurt people. It's civil. It's kind. It's fruit of the spirit smell that can only come from a sinner who has been shamed, afraid the world will know, and who knows it enough. Um, if you have noticed, I'm bald. Uh, you would have known that I was bald before I admitted I was bald. When I was younger and, uh, I had a crew cut because the crew escaped ship. (laughs) I'm sorry, that's bad. (laughs) Um, I hit it. I, you know, you can part your hair right above your ear and there's a lot of hair growing there and then you can wrap it around and you, th- you, th- you think you're hiding it. <laughs> you really do. And, and I have a cousin, in fact, a first cousin who's an atheist. And I thought I was doing pretty, I, there, I could, wouldn't even accept some speaking engagements because I wouldn't have time enough to fix my hair. <laughs> I'm, oh, I can't believe I said that. <laughs> and uh, so my atheist cousin says, you a preacher? I said, yeah, you know I'm a preacher. He said, preacher's supposed to be honest? And I said, yeah, we're called to be honest. And then he said, what the, and I can't use the language, is that stuff with your hair? That's the most dishonest thing I've ever seen (laughs) in my life. (laughs) I went, listen, this happened years ago. The statute of limitations has run out. (laughs) And you know what I did? I went home, cut my hair, uncovered my baldness, and danced. Uh, because I was free. 
I don't have to apply it. If you've been listening to what I taught you this morning, you can apply it yourself. You want to be free and joyful. You want to say, I don't care about the shame that people put on me or the fear that I experience. I'm his and I'm valuable and I'm important and I'm loved. And he likes me a lot. You think about that. I'm in.